Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to this webinar this afternoon. We are not going to keep you for a long time. It's just less than an hour, up to an hour. This is the National Department of Health, and you are tuning in on the Knowledge Hub space. Uh, the topic today is palliative care in the pediatric setting. And we have all our experts, uh, about 10, 11 experts that are anchoring this session this afternoon. Just an announcement with regards to the CPD allocations. We've been told that uh, there is a little bit of a backlog, but we, that is being managed by HPCSA. Apologies for the background noise. Uh, all the presentations will be uploaded on the Knowledge Hub. Uh, if you are not registered, please register and you can be able to take uh, courses that are accredited and uh, you can also download uh, documents and reference documents on the Knowledge Hub. We already have 124 people that have uh, logged in. We are going to just give them a uh, one minute to take the seats. Uh, we are not going to allow uh, the delegates to talk to us on the chat. Please use the Q&A box. Ask questions relevant to the topic that we're discussing today. Uh, the experts are going to be uh, helping us to answer those questions. Without any further ado, I will hand over to the the chairperson uh, to Jane, Dr. Jane, to introduce our chairperson mm -hmm. for this afternoon. And thereafter, she will drive the session. Thank you. Over to you, Jane. Thanks so much, Tabine, and to the Knowledge Hub. I'd like to introduce everyone to our program director for today. Um, Kim McQuilkin is a public health consultant from uh, with a master's in public health from University of Cape Town in health policy and system specialization. She has a background in health economics and was a previous member of the pediatric hospital level expert review committee. Kim is currently supporting the essential drugs program, in particular, the pediatric and the tertiary hospital level expert review committees and their reviews. She also works with the hemophilia subcommittee. Welcome Kim, and I'm gonna hand over to you for the rest of the session, thank you. Thank you so much, Jane, and welcome again, everyone, to this third and final webinar session in our webinar series um, on the pediatric hospital level standard treatment guidelines and EML. And uh, as Tabila mentioned earlier, today's topic is the palliative care in pediatric setting. So we have two uh, key presenters for you today. First of all, Mr. Andrew Gray is going to take us through an overview of the fifth edition of the pediatric standard treatment guidelines. And then following that, Dr. Mary and then take us through the palliative care and pediatric setting, um, kind of naming through these three areas, which are the complexities of medicine use in palliative care, new routes of medicine administration, and the expansion of the palliative care chapter. At the end of the session, we're going to have 15 minutes um, for question, answers, and discussions. And what has been mentioned before is that the chat box has been disabled. However, there is a Q&A box, so please feel free to post your questions in there. Um, as we go along, and we're going to have this time there dedicated to answer questions, and we will be closing just before 2 p.m. So our first speaker, Mr. Andrew Gray, uh, will be a familiar name to those participants who've joined us for our first two webinar sessions. For those who've joined us today for the very first time, Mr. Andrew Gray is a pharmacist whose research interests include policy analysis, rational medicines use, and application of ART in resource-constrained settings. He's a senior lecturer in the Division of Pharmacology at the University of Kozidun Natal, a consultant pharmacist for Caprisa, and a non-executive director of Gembi Health Systems, which is a non-profit uh, company developing computer IT-based healthcare solutions. Mr. Gray is also a member of the Scheduling and Naming Expert Committee of SARPRA, has an extensive involvement with various pharmaceutical societies, and is a member of WHO's Expert Panel on Drug Policies and Management. He serves on the National Essential Medicine Service Committee, NEMLAC, and was the chairperson for the latest term of the Pediatric Hospital Level Expert Review Committee. So it's with great pleasure, pleasure that I'm gonna hand over to 
Mr. Andy Gray. So whenever you're ready, Andy, you can go ahead with your presentation. Thank Thanks you. very much, Kim. Um, let me just quickly get my slides up. Can you confirm that you're seeing those on full slide view? Yes, thank you. Great, thanks very much. So this webinar is timed to coincide with the release of the fifth edition of the pediatric hospital level STGs and EML. Those documents can be found on the Knowledge Hub as a single PDF. But in addition, all the updated chapters in that new STG EML book have been uploaded on the EM Guidance mobile app. And you can just click on, on that link to access the EM Guidance app and have this at the bedside whenever you need it. I want to particularly recognize the efforts of the Pediatric Hospital Level ERC, the Expert Review Committee. My Vice Chairperson, Gary Rubinson, Professor Mo Archery, Dr. Anissa Bette, Professor Prakash Gina, Dr. Nilesh Lala, and Dr. Tanya Ruda. But although that was the core membership of the committee, we co-opted consultants for each of the chapters where we did not have the necessary expertise. And one of those was Dr. Michelle Mayring, who will be introduced a little bit later. The ERC made recommendations to the National Essential Medicines List Committee. And each of those chapters then goes out for comment before being finalized. And those stakeholder comments and contributions are absolutely crucial to the process. So going forward, I would ask you to remain engaged, to provide us with feedback on what works and what doesn't, and to continue the collaboration so that your constructive inputs can assist in ensuring that the next edition of the STG and EML moves us forward and improves on the quality of care that is provided to children in the hospital setting in South Africa. The focus today, as we've said, is on palliative care. A chapter on palliative care was first added in the previous iteration of the STG in 2017, but that chapter has been significantly expanded in the 2023 edition. In addition, we've got <clears throat> details on the principles of prescribing medicines in pediatric palliative care, and management is provided for commonly encountered symptoms in that field. So I'm going to not take up more of Michelle's time. I know she's got a lot to get through. So thank you very much for joining us today. And let me hand back to Kim to introduce our palliative care expert today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, Dr. Michelle Mehring, um, as mentioned before, was co-opted onto the Pediatric Hospital Level Expert Review Committee uh, to help with her expertise in the palliative care setting. So Dr. Michelle Mehring is a palliative care pediatrician who's worked in this field for nearly 20 years. She is the CEO of PedsPal, an NGO that provides consultative pediatric palliative care services to public and private hospitals in Cape Town. She convenes the postgraduate diploma in the pediatric palliative care at UCT. She's presented at several local and international conferences and was most recently one of the four editors of the latest edition of the Oxford textbook on palliative care for children. A long-standing child health and palliative care advocate since her PEDS HIV days, Dr. Mehring chairs a national network for children's palliative care known as Patch SA and has been involved at provincial and national levels in policymaking and palliative care in South Africa. So we're very pleased to hand over to our next presenter, Dr. Michelle Mehring. Michelle, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you please confirm that you can see my first slide? Yes, we can. Thank you. Good to go. All right. Thank you very much. It gives me great pleasure to speak to you this afternoon on palliative care in a pediatric setting. 
Um, Andy will attest to the fact that I've waited a very long time for this uh, opportunity. And it's really been amazing to increase the amount of palliative care that we've been able to include in the standard treatment guidelines. So just to start off with the definition of pediatric palliative care, because I think different people have different beliefs about what we do and what we don't do. Um, so the World Health Organization defines pediatric palliative care as the active total care of the child's body, mind, and spirit, and also includes supporting the family. Now, I've highlighted the word active there because I think people tend to think that palliative care is a passive thing you do when there's nothing more that can be done. And of course, when we, when we say those words, we're talking about it from a curative perspective. Um, and you know, when you can no longer cure a disease, there's actually a lot that needs to be done. And those things that need to be done are called palliative care. Um, and as you can see, because of the holistic nature of palliative care, we're looking after the child's body and mind and spirit, we need a multidisciplinary uh, approach. This is not something that can be done by one person or one discipline. And that team actually also needs to include the family as well as the community. And I think especially if you think about the fact that, you know, children with complex illnesses don't spend their whole lives in hospital. In fact, they spend more time at home, hopefully. That's where we want them to be. So we also need to mobilize support in the community. And according to WHO, palliative care can be practiced even if resources are limited. You can't say because we don't have a palliative care team in the hospital, we cannot practice palliative care. Palliative care needs to be everybody's business and we all need to, to be involved. Um, and as already mentioned, we need to be able to provide that care at all levels, from the patient's home right up to the tertiary level hospital. All right, so when it comes to the um, essential um, drugs list and the standard treatment guidelines, the main thing that we're obviously focusing on here is really on the relief of suffering. And it's really a key principle of palliative care is that we need to relieve suffering through the management of distressing symptoms using both drugs, but also non-drug um, measures. And I think that's a very important concept and something that we're not always taught in undergraduate curricula. We talked a lot about medications, but there's also a lot of non-medication methods that we can use to relieve suffering, which I don't think are, are adequately covered. Um, so when it comes to the management of distressing symptoms, there are certain key principles that are very helpful. Obviously, the first um, principle is that we actually need to determine and treat the underlying cause of the symptom. We're not just putting a, a plaster over the symptom. We also need to try and see what we can do to relieve the cause, if at all possible. Obviously, when diseases become non-curable, that becomes less and less possible, and we might need to increase our armamentarium of symptom control drugs. Um, and then once we've decided what the underlying symptom is and we actually want to start treating it, we've obviously got to be careful when we add further medications that we're not actually causing new symptoms because of the side effects of the medications that we are using. So with everything that we start or we add to the patient's treatment, we need to consider the benefits versus the risk. Um, and as already mentioned, we don't only consider medication, we also consider non-drug interventions. Um, and at the end of the day, whatever we do, we need to make sure that we are acting in the best interest of the individual uh, patient. So just to bring this um, point home a little bit further, I thought I would just go through a very important principle of palliative care. Um, so if you have a look at a curable illness, usually what happens is a patient presents with various symptoms and then, you know, as the doctor, you actually examine and you find various signs and hopefully the symptoms and signs lead you to a diagnosis of a condition and that enables you to start treatment that is directed at the underlying diagnosis. And usually when you institute treatment, the symptoms actually um, then disappear. With a disease-focused uh, approach to care, it's usually the doctor who guides the process through the diagnostic process. Unfortunately, when you are dealing with a non-curable illness, the treatment does not relieve the underlying uh, uh, um, symptoms. And so therefore, we actually need to focus on symptom control to relieve the patient's suffering. And because suffering is very individual, 
in this instance, it's the patient who needs to guide the process, not the, the physician. And it's very difficult, I think, particularly for pediatricians to make this shift, because I think as pediatricians, we often told, no, and we don't treat um, nausea and vomiting, we don't use antiemetics, we don't use antitussives in children, because treating the underlying disease will make those symptoms go away. And also, we're quite worried about the side effect profile of many of these medications, which is why many of us do not feel comfortable in using drugs that are commonly used to manage symptoms. Um, and for this reason, I think a lot of um, pediatricians have been very reluctant to actually utilize the symptom control medications that palliative care practitioners uh, suggest. Um, but obviously, if the patient has a disease that is not curable, these symptoms are going to persist. And it's not fair to leave, leave these patients um, suffering. And therefore, we need to be braver about some of the medications that we will utilize. All right, so when it actually comes to prescribing in pediatric palliative care, I think we need to consider um, the following. Um, obviously, we're often dealing with children with quite advanced illness, and because of their illness, they might have organ dysfunction, um, sometimes more than one um, organ, kidneys and, and, and liver. Um, often these children are wasted, they are malnourished. So all of these actually point to altered drug handling capacities, and we do need to adjust our doses uh, um, as, as needed. Another very important consideration is a lot of these kids, especially with more complicated illness, might already be on several medications before we even start adding our palliative care drugs. So one needs to consider the drug interactions and the dangers of polypharmacy when managing these children. And then, you know, as um, disease advances and the children become more terminal, some of them do lose their ability to swallow. And therefore, we need to actually become a lot more familiar with alternative methods of, of drug administration. Even getting IV access becomes increasingly problematic as these children age and as their veins are basically have been used up. So a lot of palliative care uh, teaching comes from how to utilize alternative uh, routes of administration that we might not be familiar or comfortable um, with. Um, and therein lies our major problem in pediatric palliative care at the moment is that a lot of the drugs that we are utilizing are off, off license. And it is quite scary sometimes using an off license uh, medication. Our recommendations and the evidence is growing, um, but there's still quite a lot that we are utilizing off license, which also makes the EDL process quite difficult because obviously we want to go through a very rigorous uh, scrutiny process when recommending drugs. Um, but I think at the end of the day, one always has to weigh um, the relief of suffering against the potential harms. And it's also equally uh, immoral to leave a child suffering um, when you can actually relieve that suffering with an off-license medication. So those are some of the kind of ethical dilemmas that we need to work through in order to relieve suffering using medications in pediatric palliative care. All right, so just to um, take you through what we have included in this chapter. Um, so these are the symptoms that are covered. Um, pain we didn't address in the palliative care chapter because it has a chapter on its own. Um, under gastrointestinal symptoms, we've mm -hmm. covered a dinophagia, which is a difficulty or pain on swallowing, nausea, vomiting, intractable diarrhea, and constipation. Obviously, a lot of these symptoms are also covered in other sections of the EDL, but we focus specifically on those um, symptoms that occur in the palliative care uh, context. Uh, from a respiratory um, symptoms perspective, we looked at dyspnea and chronic cough. Um, there are quite a lot of neuropsychiatric symptoms in palliative care that we have focused in this chapter on anxiety, depression, uh, dystonia, muscle spasms, spasticity, as well as intractable um, seizures. In the dermatological section, we've focused on pruritus and malodorous fungating wounds or tumors often caused by uh, malignancies that are no longer curable. And then there are a few unique palliative care emergencies that we've covered, including mucosal bleeds, spinal cord compression, as well as respiratory panic. Um, so obviously I'm not going to be able to cover all of these in a short uh, presentation, but I'm just going to speak to uh, particularly the unique things that we've added to this new chapter. Um, so what we've done in this new chapter, we have really focused on symptom management um, with the underlying causes of those symptoms being covered in other sections of the, of the essential drug list. And we often cross refer to those different uh, chapters. We've also expanded quite a bit on the general and supportive treatment. 
um, that is an important part of palliative care. And we have very importantly added, um, and with great difficulty added, some off-label recommendations of uh, things with lower evidence. As an example, the use of tropical um, metronidazole or flagell for malodorous um, fungating um, wounds, where we've basically decided that the benefit of that off-license uh, medication exceeds the, the risk or the harm to the patient um, in order for their suffering to be relieved. Um, so I think, as I've already mentioned, one of the most important additions to this chapter is the um, advice that we have provided on alternative um, routes of um, administration. Um, so as you will appreciate, especially in kids with advanced multi-system uh, pathologies, there's often a need for numerous medications with frequent administrations, and it's often quite difficult, I think, for the families to keep on top of all of these medications, especially uh, at home. Obviously, one wants to choose a route of administration that is reliable and effective, but we do also need to consider the burden to patients, and often drug uh, lists need to be uh, uh, rationalized. Um, as I've already mentioned, the oral route, unfortunately, can become problematic, especially as disease advances. And also, uh, the, these children often develop drug tolerability issues um, because of underlying symptoms, including nausea, vomiting, and dysphagia. And also, as end-of-life um, approaches and level of consciousness decreases, their capacity to swallow may also be um, affected. As many of you know who work in, in tertiary-level hospitals, often IV access becomes increasingly problematic in this population. They've often exhausted all of their peripheral veins, and sometimes even their central access points um, have become uh, 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 either thrombosed or, or infected. Um, there are also quite a, a limited number of drugs that can be administered transdermally. There are only a few um, patches that are um, available, and often, you know, patches are quite um, expensive. So for that reason, we are advising on three new routes that can, that can be utilized um, to administer drugs in patients who are no longer able to take um, orally. And these are three new routes that have been covered in this new chapter of our standard treatment guidelines. Um, so the following are the three routes. The first one is the subcutaneous route, um, where we've included, especially for morphine and midazolam administration. We've also included the intranasal um, route that can be used for midazolam, ketamine, and fentanyl. I know that my colleague, Dr. Nisa Bate, covered a lot of this with the um, pain chapter, uh, but we do also utilize this route in palliative care. And then we do also have the buccal and sublingual routes that can be used for midazolam and fentanyl administration. So I think one of the important take home messages here is that, you know, when a child enters the end of life stage, we really don't want to be pricking and prodding them to try and get uh, a line up because it really is quite distressing to the family and to the child. And there are other ways of still getting symptom control drugs into the child without having to torture them by trying to gain intravenous access. And we do hope that people will be able to get increasingly comfortable with utilizing these alternative uh, routes. Um, so one of the most important routes that's utilized in palliative care is the subcutaneous route. And the ideal medication for that route are medications that are hydrosoluble with a neutral pH, that also are low viscosity and also a low molecular uh, um, weight. Um, there's quite a lot of evidence in the literature for both morphine and midazolam, and that's the major two drugs that we have recommended in the STGs. Um, it's actually very amazing because, you know, you can achieve the same um, morphine drug levels with subcutaneous administration as compared to IV administration. So there's no reason why a patient who is not able to swallow and you're no longer able to get intravenous access to can not have and enjoy the 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 um, get gold standard of, of pain control because you can give morphine subcutaneously. And there's also no reason why any child should need to fit uncontrollably because you do not have IV access. You can also give midazolam uh, uh, subcutaneously. Um, so I think it really is a route that we need to develop increasing comfort uh, in, in utilizing. Um, so just to go down a little bit more details on the subcutaneous pathway, um, usually we use a, a syringe driver or a device that provides um, a delivery of medication over a 24 hour period. Um, one often has to start off the infusion just with, as with IV infusions with a bit of a bolus. Um, 
but the size of syringes that we use are smaller than in the ICU setting. 20 mil syringe is the most commonly uh, recommended size because we also don't want to be transfusing very big volumes of fluid into the subcutaneous space. So our drug concentrations in that syringe do tend to be a lot higher than with our intravenous uh, um, infusions. And I think one of the unique things in palliative care teaching is that you can actually combine several medications in the same syringe. I know in ICUs, we tend to have one syringe driver per medication, but obviously because volume is of a big consideration in the subcutaneous route, uh, we, we tend to combine medications in the same syringe driver. Um, for that reason, we do need to know which drugs are compatible with other drugs, and um, you do need to know which drugs you can and cannot mix together in the same uh, syringe driver. All of the drugs that we have uh, mentioned in the STG are actually compatible and can be mixed. We haven't put in any subcutaneous dexamethasone or things that cannot be administered with other drugs into our, uh, our STG. All right, so obviously when one puts up the subcutaneous Spontaneous uh, syringe driver, you need to select a site. It needs to be an area of the body that has got some subcutaneous fat. Obviously, sometimes this does become a bit problematic in our very wasted, chronically ill children. Um, but the most commonly used sites are at the back, around about the scapula, in the anterior chest wall, in the anterior aspect of the upper arm, the abdominal wall, or the anterior aspect of the thigh. And inserting the needle, we usually use a, a butterfly needle. It's usually done very similar to the way that one would do a, um, a PPD test or a tuberculin test for TB. So you really just put in a, a bit of EMLA, local anesthetic, wait half an hour, and then insert the needle into the subcutaneous space. And it's one prick rather than trying a million times to get an, in, in, to get an IV line uh, up. Um, quite important to choose a site that's not near a joint. You obviously don't want to have any um, potential obstruction. And obviously the site does need to be accessible so that the nurse or the healthcare worker can actually continue to inspect the site and make sure everything is okay. But also it needs to be in a place where especially a very young child is not able to pull it out. So in the younger children, we do tend to, to choose the back as a site where the child is not able to reach and pull their, um, their line out. Um, sometimes irritation at the site does occur, um, and there are certain things that you can do to try and minimize site irritation. You can use more um, dilute uh, um, uh, preparations, and also instead of you know working out a volume for 24 hours, you can actually use a more dilute volume and put, run it over a 12-hour regime and actually change up your... Um, uh, 0.9% saline for water to in, to decrease the, the irritation. Um, you might ask yourself, okay, so do we need new drivers for this um, route of an administration? And actually in hospitals, most of the standard IV infusion pumps can also be used uh, um, subcutaneously. Um, obviously, in the home setting where the subcutaneous route is very, very helpful because it actually can keep the patient at home, we can't use the you know, the big electric ICU syringe drivers. And in those instances, we actually um, recommend the, the, the use of battery operated devices. Um, many people who worked in hospices before are probably familiar with the Grasby pump. Unfortunately, the Grasby pump is no longer being manufactured and the T34 has been used as its replacement. Um, in my setting in the Western Cape, it's actually become available and can be ordered. We've mostly been using it for adults. We haven't really had the capacity to do home subcut infusions for children uh, uh, yet. Um, but of course, remember, these are scheduled drugs that we're going to be administered. So whenever a syringe driver is set up at home, it has there has to be a nurse that goes to that home and, and does regular visits. And for that reason, it's been quite limited in terms of how many patients we can send home because we don't have the nurses in the home setting, unfortunately, that can maintain the use of these uh, drivers in the home setting. Um, the next slide is just a, a short video. Um, it's a British video that just takes you through a little bit of the T34 syringe driver. Today we're looking at the T34 syringe driver and how to set it up. Please make sure you look at your local guidelines. The instructions that you need are the buttons on the front of the syringe driver here and the instructions at the side here. This is a computer inside here, 
so please make sure that you don't drop this or bang it. There are three detection points, the barrel clamp arm, the collar and the plunger. To start with you need to check that the pump is clean and undamaged, that the barrel clamp arm is down and that you put the battery in. Keep your fingers out of the way as the pump will need to do its preloading checks. You do this by turning the machine on. The screen will tell you what is happening. Before we go any further we need to make sure that we've got enough power in the battery to last for the next 24 hours. To do this you press the information key and watch the instructions on the little window here. So you check the battery level yes and it will tell you this battery's got 98%. If the battery has only got 15% or less, if you work in the OUH, then you need to change the battery. If the battery life is only 30% or less in the community, then you need to change the battery then. The next stage is to load the syringe. You need to make sure that the syringe fits properly. Line your syringe up with where it will be and use these keys to move the plunger to the right spot. You then pull the barrel clamp up, arm up, and fit the syringe in place. And replace the barrel clamp arm. This will give you some instructions on the front that will tell you to confirm the make of syringe. It says 30 BD Plastica. This is a 30ml BD Plastica. You're asked to confirm this by pressing the yes button. Then you need to go to the patient and insert the cannula into the patient. And then you can start the infusion. The infusion will tell you what the rate is and how long left you've got for the infusion. It's really important that you put the keypad lock on so that none of these keys are activated whilst the pump is running. And to do this, you press the info key and hold it, and you make sure that it beeps. None of these keys will now work. If you want to check the battery level, press the info key twice, and that will confirm to you how much battery life is left. Any issues that arise from using this machine, if there are any problems with the occlusion, or it stops working, or the, there's a problem, follow the instructions that are written on the screen and look at your syringe driver guidelines which will give you more information on troubleshooting. At the end of 24 hours, when you need to renew the, the syringe because the medications run out, you draw up the medication uh, as prescribed, you take the syringe to the patient, what you need to do is unlock the keypad which is hold down the information key, listen until it's got an alarm, press the stop key and you press the on off key and again you wait for the beep following the instructions. You then remove the syringe and you're ready to start again with all the checks from the beginning. All right, so I'm not recommending that we all go out and rush out and buy T34 syringe drivers. They are fairly complicated. You do need to know how to use it. But I just wanted to present that to show an option for actually managing quite complex patients at home. Uh, a dream one day. <laughs> All right, um, the other routes that we have covered in this new STG are the intranasal as well as the buccal route. So um, the uh, ideal um, use for intranasal medication, especially in palliative care, is actually for the management of breakthrough um, um, symptoms, so especially things like uh, seizures or pain. What's nice about the intranasal um, route is that actually um, because of the risk because of the rich vasculature of the nasal mucosa, um, our drugs actually can have rapid effect after uh, after administration, and actually the same peaks are are are, are achieved following intravenous uh, administration. It's usually quite painless. It's a bit uncomfortable. Um, you know, children don't like stuff being squir squirted up their nose, but it is very inexpensive and it's actually easy to deliver. And actually a mom could be taught how to use this uh, um, at home. And obviously it's also very useful in a child who doesn't have IV um, access. Using um, medication intranasally, although you've got to buy um, a mucosal at atomizing device, 
that costs about 40 rand each, um, can actually save you on intravenous uh, resources. It's more efficient to use. Um, it's obviously more rapid. It's so much quicker to stick up something up the nose than actually drip a child. And it actually provides a higher patient and provider satisfaction because of how quick and effective it is. And because it avoids uh, first uh, First pass drug metabolism, there's also a higher bioavailability of drugs that are administered uh, intranasally. So we do commonly use midazolam uh, for breakthrough um, seizures or fentanyl for um, breakthrough pain in palliative care patients who are not able to, um, to swallow. Um, so basically, when, when, when you utilize an intranasal drug, you've obviously once again, like with the subcutaneous route, you use as very small, the smallest possible um, volume. Um, what one can do if the volume is quite high is you can actually break the volume up into two and you can actually use both nostrils, giving half the drug in the one nostril and the other half in the other. Um, and then obviously using the mucosal atomizing device that makes a fine spray increases the amount of drug that can be uh, uh, absorbed. Um, obviously, you've got to, got to make sure that the, the nasal passages are clear, you know, make sure there's no blood or mucus that's actually going to inhibit medication absorption. Um, and also very important to know that adverse events with the, the intranasal uh, route of administration are actually quite um, rare. The most common side effect is actually a little bit of nasal um, burning or irritation, often seen with midazolam. But apart from that, it's actually a very safe uh, route of administering uh, drugs, especially for breakthrough um, symptoms. And the buccal or sublingual routes are also two routes that can be utilized. With the buccal route, we are placing drug between the gum and the cheek. And with the sublingual route, we're actually placing drugs underneath the, the tongue. Obviously, the difficulties with these routes are particularly in a patient that's got um, a clenched jaw or a patient that's fitting. Um, so we obviously would not utilize that uh, route in, in, in those instances. Um, similar to the intranasal route, it obviously uh, absorption is very fast through the rich vasculature of the oral mucosa. Once again, we bypass first pass metabolism, so we have a high bioavailability. And we can also continue to um, administer drugs in a child who's no longer able to uh, um, swallow. Um, just some cautions, obviously, if there is uh, mucositis or other causes of oral irritation, it's not a good idea to use um, this route. Um, and also, very importantly, after the patient has had a sublingual or a, a buccal dose, should not allow them to drink, chew or swallow until the medication has had time to be uh, absorbed. Otherwise, obviously, it's going to be absorbed by the food and then um, swallowed down into the stomach. Uh, but once again, a very uh, efficient route. Um, especially for uh, breakthrough pain, we sometimes use sublingual clonidine and also fentanyl and midazolam for pain and seizures, respectively. So another very uh, useful route if you have a child who's no longer able to um, swallow. Um, there's obviously um, really just touched on the tip of the iceberg when it comes to managing children requiring palliative care. So I have provided some further uh, information. If you go to um, the Patch SA website, that's the South African Children's Palliative Care Network, we have a whole online Patch Academy. There are 12 courses that are available online. They range from being completely free to I think our most expensive course is 450 Rand. And there's a lot of interactive uh, um, courses that you can do right from just a basic introduction to palliative care through to the symptom control end of life uh, topics, as well as many psychosocial um, topics, including um, the support of uh, grief and bereavement. Um, for those of you who are interested in studying even further, um, I do convene the postgraduate diploma in pediatric palliative care at UCT. And we're actually busy enrolling for next year, the um, uh, portal closes on the 30th of September, so if you would like to study with us next year, please do sign up. And the other very important resource is the Association of Pediatric Palliative Medicine, which is based in the UK, releases a pharmacopedia, and really this is the world's best resource when it comes to finding the, the, the doses for palliative care medication in the world. It's updated every um, two to three years. The next edition is actually currently being updated. But if you go to that link, you can actually find that pharmacopedia. And a lot of the drug doses that are in the STGs actually do come from 
that pharmacopoeia because of a lot of the medications being off license. It's actually quite tricky to find the dosage for, for certain drugs, which is why this pharmacopoeia is a very, very helpful resource. So that's the end of my presentation and I welcome any questions at this point. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle. Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, so first of all, I think, yeah, someone's, uh, just in case uh, people missed it earlier, um, there's a question about can we use intravenous midazolam intranasally? Yes, it's the, sorry, thank you for that question. It's the same intravenous preparations that are used in, in, in either of those routes, the subcutaneous route, the intranasal and the uh, uh, buccal route, yeah. Perfect, thanks. Uh, and then we have a question, um, in resource constrained environments, is it still possible to achieve appropriate comfort and are there important considerations in these types of settings? Yeah, that's a very, very broad question. <laughs> um, you know, and I want to draw your attention to the fact that WHO says that palliative care sh can and should be practiced in resource limited settings. Um, and actually many of the tricks that we we've come up with in the palliative care world have been around patients being really desperate and wanting to go home, um, you know, and get out of the hospital environment. Um, unfortunately, our big barrier in South Africa is that we don't have enough nurses um, to manage patients at home. But, you know, that said, I have trained many mothers to load syringe drivers, to administer drugs, at home, obviously under some um, supervision. Um, but, you know, I think especially in resource limited settings where hospitals are busy places and, you know, it's not the ideal place always for end of life, you know, through utilizing the community and the, and the parents, we have actually managed to look after quite complicated children at home in, in quite resource uh, poor settings. I do sometimes find that, unfortunately, you know, caring for children in shacks with lots of people in one room um, can be very difficult, but unfortunately, we don't have um, very many hospices in South Africa, which is why we often have to, to do end-of-life care in, in a hospital. Um, but, you know, I still think you can do what you can with what you have. You know, you can be quite creative in, in making a more conducive environment to providing care for that child uh, in, in a hospital. And I know it sounds like a, a bit trite, but one of the most important things that I can say about providing end of life and palliative care in the hospital is be present. You know, what, what we sadly often see in hospitals is people bypass their child's cubicle because they think that child's receiving palliative care, there's nothing active we can do any, anymore, and they just bypass that cubicle and go on to the next patient in the ward round. And actually just going into that room and saying to the parent, I'm still here for you can make a world of difference. And that doesn't cost any extra time or money. So it's really difficult to be present with people that are suffering, but it makes such a difference to them to know that you are there and that you care. Oh, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, another question we have for you. Are there any potential adverse effects that need to be monitored for when using the new routes of administration? Yeah, I mean, obviously the usual um, side effects as per the intravenous uh, uh, drug administrations are important. Um, and I think I have mentioned quite a lot of them already. Obviously with the subcutaneous administration, you can get a bit of sight irritation uh, and you need to use the tricks that I have um, spoken of. And obviously, as I've already mentioned with the intranasal administration, you can um, uh, get a bit of a burning. I think the most important and the potential danger of these routes is when you have any break in the mucosal integrity. Obviously, the absorption of your drug can be increased. So I'd be very careful not to administer drugs if you've got any break in the integrity of your of your membranes. Oh, thanks so much. So I think we're doing very well time-wise. Um, and I've just seen there's a comment on uh, to the participants. Uh, someone with if anyone with raised hands, um, to please pose your okay. Yeah, sorry. If there's any um, outstanding questions, if you just pose them into the Q and A box. In the meantime, I'm just gonna see if there's any closing remarks uh, from from Andy and Michelle. Maybe I can hand over to you, Andy. Do you have any closing remarks? Thanks. Uh, final <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, Thanks, Kim. So, Michelle, one of the questions that I answered in the Q&A was around the rectal route. Um, yes. And the question was, can it still be used in, for example, pain and epilepsy? And although we, I've pointed out that we do have um, the rectal administration of IV diazepam as one of the options in status epilepticus, we really are trying to move 
away from the rectal route, for example, of paracetamol. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to give some idea of ongoing, not, not just in hospital where you might use IV paracetamol, but ongoing use of the rectal route for pain um, in an ambulatory care setting? Yes. I mean, we obviously do. It's not it's really unpleasant to have something stuck up your bottom. <laughs> um, but that said, you know, I have sometimes um, sent moms home with little feeding tubes and midazolam in case they have, uh, you know, ongoing seizures. But it's equally as easy to give, you know, lorazepam sublingually or buccally. So we really try to avoid it where at all possible. That said, I do know that in some African palliative care programs, they have actually been using long-acting MST rectally in patients where there's no access to a fentanyl patch and there's no access to subcutaneous syringe driver and the patient is no longer able to swallow and you're really uh, desperate, you know, the rectal root sometimes does uh, get used. I think it's very important when utilizing the rectal root to remember about the blood supply of the rectum. Um, so the upper two thirds more venous and the lower third more arterial. And you do want to make sure that you're actually pushing the drug up uh, high enough to, uh, to be absorbed and not too low to cause side effects or actually for the drug to come out. So I think, you know, the rectal route can be used in an absolute emergency, but you do need to know how to utilize it uh, uh, properly. Then, um, thanks, Michelle. The other question was around flumazenil and its use in um, benzodiazepine overdose. It's not listed in the EML um, mm -hmm. in our poisoning chapter. And there's a warning on the adult side that it increases um, the risk of dysrhythmias, for example. So flumazenil is not on the EML and might not be available everywhere. What is your experience using it or not using it um, in, for, for example, somebody who has had an excessive dose of a benzodiazepine? Yeah. yeah. I must say, in 20 years of palliative care practice, I have hardly ever had to reverse any of, any of my drugs, you know. I have, I think I've used naloxone maybe twice, and I've never needed to use flumazenol because we, we tend to be more careful with our dosing. Um, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Kim. Any further questions coming from the q and I did see Sorry, one that you answered, which was about the how long can you leave a subcut line in? I think somebody uh, wrote this. Yeah. Um, and I must say that um, we've actually experienced that the subcutaneous lines sometimes last longer than the, uh, the intravenous lines. I think the longest I've ever left a subcut line in for has been about uh, 10 to 10 to 12 days. Obviously, you know, one needs to rotate your site if your site has become inflamed. Um, but you know, as long as it's working and, and the patient's symptoms are being relieved, you can continue to use the same uh, site, which is one of the beauties of the subcut route is that it does last longer and requires less pain to, um, to reinstate compared to an intravenous line. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, oh, so there's a question that's just come through. Um, what are your thoughts about sublingual atropine for children with sialuria? Yes. Um, so that is definitely in the current uh, STG and uh, it's an absolute game changer. So we basically use the atropine eye drops. The ophthalmo ophthalmologists get really cross with us because we, we, we repleted the stores at Red Cross once. Um, but, you know, in our kiddies with CP or our children that are not able to swallow and that are drooling excessively, you place one to two drops sublingually every six hours uh, underneath their tongue or in the buccal space. And it really um, dries up their uh, uh, secretions. Um, quite nicely. Um, there is unfortunately tolerance that develops to sublingual atropine. So unfortunately, after using it for a prolonged period of time, it may, lo may no longer be um, efficacious. Um, one word of caution, it does the systemic absorption of the sublingual atropine isn't enough to cause any cardiovascular side effects, but we do sometimes see papillary dilatation. So do be wary of it in, in you know, ventilated patients where you're trying to follow up on their neurology, that sometimes the sublingual atropine can cause um, dilated uh, um, pupils. 
Um, in other countries, they do actually have um, scopolamine patches that they can use, especially when you've developed tolerance to sublingual atropine, but we don't have them available in South Africa, and they're also not on our, on our EDL, but very, very useful uh, adjunct for patients with excessive secretions, but also, you know, we commonly use it in managing pneumonias at the end of life. Oh, fantastic. Thanks for answering that question. Uh, so I think we have uh, no more questions coming through the Q&A. So I just want to ask Michelle if you've got any final comments uh, from your side. Yeah, I mean, I think I just want to say to people, I think it's quite scary when you see these new routes and, uh, you know, medications being used in ways that you might not be familiar with or not comfortable with. And, you know, obviously, um, one does always need to weigh the, the risks versus the harm of it. But I think too many of us have seen too many patients suffering unnecessarily. So I just want to encourage you to be brave um, and please do join the Patch South Africa community, which will actually help you to increase your courage. And if you are struggling to manage any patients, you're welcome to pop a question on our Patch SA uh, WhatsApp group. And we help you happy to also link you up with a palliative care provider in your area. Thank you so much to you and for a wonderful presentation. Uh, since this is the last of the, the three in the webinar series, uh, perhaps Andy, if you've got any uh, final remarks from yourself. Thanks very much, Kim. And thank you to everyone who's joined. Um, we've had nearly 280 people participating in today's webinar. And I think it illustrates what interest there is, not only in CPD and the points that you might need, but in getting access to updated information. These are painstakingly evidence-based guidelines, and we've tried wherever possible to show where the evidence has come from, where we've added new medicines for pediatric use. Those medicine reviews have also been made available through the Essential Drugs Program. But if there is anything that you spot in any of these um, STGs that you feel is problematic or that you are battling to interpret, please let us know and we will endeavor to make the necessary changes and to update them and ensure that accurate information gets to everyone. And a thank you once more to the Knowledge Hub, but also to the entire um, Essential Drugs Program staff in Pretoria who have supported this entire process from beginning to end. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andy. Thank you for your guidance um, as chairperson of this previous uh, iteration of the standard treatment guidelines. And thanks to everyone for attending this webinar. Thank you to all the participants. Uh, there's the link again for post-webinar survey. Uh, and please, if you have any inquiries about this webinar, you please, feel, uh, please feel free to email the EDP uh, email address there, saedp at health.gov. .za. The session has been recorded and all presentations will be shared on the Knowledge Hub. So ending a little bit early before 2 p.m. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a pleasant day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thank Michelle. Much, Michelle. Stunning presentation. <laughs> Wonderful. No, no, no. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> People want a lunchtime experience, and that's exactly what you gave them. That was okay, perfect. no, cool. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bye. Michelle. Bye. Thank Thanks, you. Andy. Bye. Bye. Thank you Thanks, so much. Jane. Thanks, Kim. Cheers all the way to. And Tanya, thanks for joining today. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.